volunteers and staff with the mission of empowering individuals to take control of their own health and wellness. The program features free interactive workshops, which are now in this format on Zoom uh, a few times per year that reaffirm the importance of caring for the person as a whole, body, mind, and spirit. Designed to complement traditional lectures and health talks, each workshop focuses on some component of wellness. The committee who plans and conducts these workshops consists of Gisela Boxleitner, Bud Wassell, Denise Romano, Danielle Sagnella, Beverly Block, and myself. I also would like to recognize and thank Lisa Adams from our audiovisual department, who always helps us immensely with the technology behind the scenes so that this can be possible. Uh, please let us know after the program if you have any suggestions for future topics and remember to complete the evaluation at the end as we value all of your feedback. So last little bit of housekeeping. Uh, once Joan is done with her presentation, we will have time for interactive questions and answers. Please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. That is how we will collect those questions and then be able to talk about them during the Q&A. Uh, we'll make every attempt to get to all of your questions. Okay, I'm gonna introduce Joan Palmer, our, our guest for today and speaker. Uh, Joan is the founder, director, and an instructor at the Institute of Sustainable Nutrition. She has a master's degree in human nutrition, a bachelor's in education, and is certified as a family and community herbalist. Joan teaches the art and science of eating at the Graduate Institute, as well as food as medicine at Quinnipiac University. She raises plants, chickens, bees, and boys, uh, love that, in the beautiful hills of West Granby, Connecticut. Um, and we're grateful to have her here uh, with us from Granby um, for today's program. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Joan. Thank you for being here and sharing your wisdom with us. Oh, thank you, Nicole. Um, I do have to say that those chickens actually were all eaten by a bobcat. <laughs> so I have to take that off the bio for this year, um, which is rather sad. But um, so uh, thank you everyone for joining us um, to talk about the microbiome. It is really a, a kind of a new area of research or it's, it's a, a burgeoning area of research. There are um, a lot of studies out there that are exploring the the different aspects of the microbiome and how that influences us. You, you need to remember that we have evolved with these bacteria. Um, we, are, we are more of the bacteria than we are of us. And I'll explain that as we go. And so they, it really is an important aspect of our health and an important thing for us to um, to have an understanding and a, a knowledge base to nurture these microbes for both our physical health and our emotional health. So I am going to share my screen with you and we're going to do a PowerPoint and then we're going to talk about some of these delicious foods behind me. So I am going to... Okay, um, so I, I think this, this saying is so true. Um, you can pay the farmer now or the doctor later, real food matters, that we are discovering the health benefits of real food and the, the importance of, of that in part of our health routine. So anyway. So things we're going to talk about today are um, what is the human microbiome? What are the benefits of a healthy microbiome? How is that acquired? And then disorders associated, not necessarily causing, associated with an unhealthy microbiome. What contributes to an unhealthy microbiome? And then what contributes to how do we support and grow a healthy 
microbiome. And then we have to take a few minutes to talk about fermented foods. So I am going to minimize that. So the microbiome is a unique makeup of colonies of microorganisms that live on and in us. In fact, we each have our unique colony of microorganisms that is as unique as your fingerprint. So if we were able to do a snapshot of each person's microbiome, each one would be uniquely yours and not anyone else's. Um, so we, we acquire these throughout our lives from, from birth to death. We are acquiring our specific microbiome. And there are lots of things we do that enhance and, and cause that microbiome to flourish and many things that cause it to die back. And so we'll talk about all of those. Um, these colonies um, are deeply influenced by our diet and our lifestyle. And we'll talk about all of that. So the microbiome is, it, they are the bacteria. We're talking about the bacteria that is on our skin, our hair, our face, um, and also in us. And it's really interesting because if we took a snapshot and were able to look at the, the microbes here in the crook of your arm, they'd be really different than say the microbes on your calf. They are unique to that area of the body and they all have unique functions. Um, here are some of the bacteria, archaea, fungi, viruses, yeasts, and other microbes. The fascinating thing about that is that those are the same microbes that we see in the microbiome of the soil or the rhizosphere of the soil. And that we know there are deep similarities between the soil and plant microbiomes and the human microbiome, which is just a fascinating topic. Um, so we're going to look at this, um, sorry, we're going to look at this for just a moment. This is a picture of the digestive system. Um, the, the tube here at the top, that is your esophagus. Food come, you chew your food, it comes down, goes into the stomach where it is chemically and mechanically broken down into um, smaller particles. And then it leaves the stomach and enters here, the small intestines. And the small intestines are where most of our digestion happens. So it continues to break the food down into its smallest particles. And when it gets to the smallest particle, it will be able to move through the cell, the cell walls of the intestine and go through the rest of the process to be absorbed into the body. Um, this is about 21 to 23 feet long, the small intestines, which is quite remarkable that you have that in you. Um, but the, that's in order for us to get as much nutrition as possible. So we want a really long ride for that food to try and extract as much as we can. Um, once it's done that and moved through, it enters here, down here, into the large intestines. Now the large intestines are only between seven and nine feet long, but they're bigger in diameter. And what happens here is much less of the um, absorption is happening here. This is more um, reabsorption of water and things like that and getting the food, the undigested part of the food ready to leave the body in our stool. So this section, the large intestines is where most of our bacteria reside. There are up to 
I think we think 100 trillion bacteria residing in this area of the body. And what is moving into that area is the undigested part of the food or the fiber of the food. We always hear, oh, you need to eat more fiber. You need to have lots of fiber in your diet. Well, one of the main reasons for that is to provide food to the microbes that colonize the large intestines, okay? So that's where we're gonna spend the most time today is in the large intestines talking about, about those microbes. Um, so the purpose of that is to feed those microbes, okay? So why is the microbiome important? And again, we're talking about the ones that reside in those in the large intestines. So they act as immune modulators. That means that they kind of are, are training your immune system. They, they keep your immune system from getting out of hand as in um, autoimmune issues. Um, and keep it active enough so that it is your immune system is, is steady and, and healthy for you. So it, it keeps your immune system right where it needs to be. It helps to modulate that. They actually chelate heavy metals and other toxins from the body. And chelate means they kind of grab onto and have a way of bonding to get those toxins and heavy metals out of your body so that they don't stay in the body and lodge in areas that you don't want them to get reabsorbed into the body. We want to get toxins out of our body as easily and quickly as possible. And these microbes help do that. Um, they convert that undigested food into many of our B vitamins. So we are actually getting a lot of our nutrition from these microbes in our gut, especially B12. And we have large stores of B12 in our body, but if we use that B12 up, we, we can't survive. So these bacteria are actually in there helping to convert the B12 to a usable form for us. They make vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 is helps to drive bone or calcium into bone. It helps um, vitamin D convert to a usable form. It's, it's, it's just a really important um, nutrient in our body and they are responsible for that. So they also help make short chain fatty acids. What the heck is a short chain fatty acid? Um, they are um, short chains fats that we use for different different issues, different um, uses. So they make butyric acid, which actually feeds our intestines. So these bacteria then make fatty acids to feed the cells in our intestines. Right now we see a lot of people who have um, digestive issues going on, a lot of um, intestinal issues going on. And these short chain fatty acids that are assisted by these microbes actually help to feed and take care of that lining of your intestines to keep them healthy. Um, they reduce, short chain fatty acids actually reduce inflammation. And we know all disease, almost every disease I can think of is caused by inflammation. So these short chain fatty acids help to modulate that, that inflammation, reduce it, and that is helped by these microbes. So they also, and here's the part about the happiness, they also help to make chemical neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are, mess, are chemical messengers in your body that allow your brain to communicate to the rest of the body and what to do. These are things like serotonin, GABA, dopamine. These neurotransmitters help you to improve in sleep and your mood. It's, they, they are hugely important. There is um, 
there are actually, so we know that there are receptor sites for these neurotransmitters. And we used to always think that most of the serotonin, most of these um, receptor sites were in the brain, that serotonin was something that, that your brain was producing and it was there. But we've recently discovered with the study of the microbiome that most of your receptor sites, more of your receptor sites, serotonin receptor sites are in your gut, not the brain. So quite remarkable and again, showing the importance of that, um, of those neurotransmitters and that microbiome. So healthy microbiome helps make a healthy, healthy, happy person. Okay. So how do we do that? How do we create a healthy microbiome in us? Um, when, and we used to believe that the womb was completely sterile. When you are, when the the fetus is in the, the womb, that that's a completely sterile environment. We're learning that it's not quite as sterile as we thought, but it is very controlled over what can cross that placenta into that environment. So basically the baby is, is sealed off from a lot of the, the bacteria and, and microbes of the world. But at birth, and I'm talking about a vaginal birth, as the baby moves through the birth canal, that baby is coated in the mother's microbes that line her birth canal. And so that baby is, a, is first inoculated at birth. And we now know the importance of that first inoculation. And so what they've been doing in a lot of hospitals is that C-section babies who do not get that exposure to those microbes are actually being swabbed by the doctors with the mother's microbes. So they, they take a cloth and they, they swab the mother with that and then they swab the baby with it to introduce that to the baby. And so at that moment, your, the baby's microbiome looks very much like the mother's microbiome because that has been the introduction that that baby's gotten. Um, and then the baby is maybe breastfed and the mother is holding that baby and the baby is up against her skin and getting milk from, from her. And that's another inoculation of microbes to that baby. And then that baby gets passed from aunts and uncles and grandparents and siblings and parents and and that skin to skin contact that that baby is getting, the kisses, the, you know, just the resting on your skin on the, on the chest of a, of a parent, that is introducing more microbes to that baby. When a baby gets older and it becomes a toddler and starts playing and putting every dirty thing in their mouth, um, playing outside in the dirt, petting all of their animals, that is another introduction to microbes in the environment that train your immune system, keep you healthy and, and expose and build your microbiome, your specific microbes. They have actually done um, studies and found that kids raised on farms with a lot of animals and who are in the dirt and out helping and you know doing all of those things tend to have lower rates of things like asthma and other childhood diseases that um, that are maybe inflammatory based because they have gotten a, a larger exposure to all of these different microbes in their environment, training their immune system to be more robust. Um, and so exposure to a less than perfectly clean environment isn't such a bad thing. Um, I know many people are probably cheering right now that you don't need to keep everything sterile when you have an infant that, um, I mean, you want, you want to use common sense. Um, when we eat raw foods, when we go out to the farm, all the beautiful CSAs and farms, those are uh, community supported agriculture where you get to go out and pick your own vegetables or you, you head out there and you're picking things and nibbling and um, 
eating things directly from your garden or the farm, those all plants are coated with microbes that help protect those plants. And um, when we eat those, we're adding to our microbiome. A lot of virulent um, microbes would get um, killed by our digestive system, uh, but some of the ones that we want to to colonize are able to get through and into our system. Um, and then fermented foods. Fermented foods are having a revival this last decade. Um, and we're going to talk more about those at the end uh, to introduce you to some of these delicious and microbial rich foods. Okay, so who is actually in charge? So if we look at the microbiome in, a, in the humans, we know that we have 10 times more microbes in and on us than we have our own cells, which equates to more microbial DNA than human DNA on us. So if we are more microbes, who's really in charge here? Is it, is it us making the decisions and um, deciding what we're gonna eat or is there other, are there other influences? So we know that these microbes, when they get to a critical mass, meaning whoever gets to a certain population in your large intestines, is the one that's gonna send the loudest signal. So in the positive sense, if you are eating really well and you're living a stress-free life and living pretty healthy, you're going to feed the microbes that are going to be benefiting you and your health. And they are going to therefore reproduce and build up their population. And that's who's going to be signaling you. And then you tend to have much better results with, um, with what's being produced in your body, those neurotransmitters and things like that, and the foods you crave. Conversely, if you are eating a lot of sugar and refined foods, um, a lot of, of foods that just aren't really nutrient dense, and we'll get to that too in a minute, you tend to allow the bacteria that thrive on those foods to become dominant. They are getting all the nutrition, so they're growing and repopulating, and their population gets big enough where it actually sends the signal to the brain. And in the case, let's look at something like candida, where we know that that is something that thrives on sugar. And if their population, you've been eating a lot of sugar, you haven't been eating a lot of high fiber foods, sugar will become almost addictive. And what's happening is the, that, that microbe is actually increasing population enough to send the signal to your brain to say, sugar, you want sugar. And you start thinking, oh my gosh, I, I finished dinner. I just need some sugar. And there are a lot of factors that influence that, but they have a strong message to your brain to get you to crave those foods. It is the same the other way. You eat really well and those others populate and the signaling is going to be, oh, I would love a, a beautiful crisp apple right now. And you know, it, you start training yourself. We think it's ourselves the other way, but is it uh, training us or is it training those, those microbes and helping them to populate? That's something that's being researched more and more and is quite fascinating. So what we do in our life determines which microbes will dominate our body and our brain. Um, so Okay, here are some of the disorders that are associated with an unhealthy microbiome. And I am not saying necessarily cause, but definitely play a role in 
Um, and that when we have a really healthy microbiome, it helps to um, it helps to, to keep this in check. And we've talked about some of the reasons why, and we'll go through that. So autoimmune issues where your immune system is, is really running on high. Remember, we talked right at the beginning, these microbes are immune modulators. They help tame that and keep that at an even keel. Anxiety and depression, those a lot of times are the neurotransmitters. We aren't producing enough of those. And so when we increase healthy microbes to our gut, they can help with those neurotransmitters that will help um, with our dopamine and our GABA and our serotonin. Those are things that make us feel good, sleep well, um, and can help with anxiety and depression. Obesity, we have actually, we meaning scientists in labs have actually, they breed mice to have obesity genes and be, um, so they'll use those obese mice in studies. They have actually taken microbes from obese mice, inserted them into lean non-obese mice and induced obesity to them. So um, microbes definitely play a role in, in your, the weight. Um, and Parkinson's, bowel disorders, MS, Alzheimer's, autism, all of those are um, inflammatory based. And remember we talked about microbes help produce those short chain fatty acids, which are anti-inflammatory. So they help keep the inflammation suppressed in our body and all disease has an inflammatory factor. So, um, so many of our maladies that are, we are seeing increasing right now um, can be linked to an unhealthy microbiome. Okay, what are the contributors to that unhealthy microbiome? Antibiotics. Now, antibiotics are so important. They actually ex extended our lifespan. When we started, when we discovered and began to use antibiotics, the lifespan of, of people went up substantially. They are really essential, but they have been overused as we all know, and we're producing virulent strains of bacteria that no longer are responding to antibiotics. They are in our food system. They are being used in feedlots where we, um, they, they're used to fatten the animals in feedlots and they are used to keep them from getting sick and dying because they are in less than optimal conditions to, in being raised. So we have been ingesting an awful lot of, of those antibiotics through our lives. And that uh, they're outlawing that in a lot of the, the food industry. Uh, poor diets and not enough fiber. So if we're not eating enough fiber, we're actually starving those microbes. Those beneficial microbes are starving in our system and they aren't re being able to reproduce and colonize our intestines. Um, the same junk food, uh, the chemicals, refined carbs, unhealthy fats, those all um, first don't serve to um, feed and stimulate those microbes. And some of those can actually um, kill the microbes. Sugar, we talked about that. It stimulates bacteria that we don't necessarily want to have thriving. Um, artificial sweeteners go into the chemical um, realm. And some of those were actually uh, have some, some toxicity associated with them. And then environmental toxins, you know, if you're ingesting environmental toxins, which is really hard not to do, a lot of that kills our microbiome. Um, gl glyphosate, that's in genetically modified organisms. Um, glyphosate is used on some of the fields for that and actually is the number one um, herbicide used out there and pesticide herbicide. It is, um, 
it is found on in soil, infants, um, water, it is everywhere. And it was first patented as an antibiotic. So it is really um, causing some problems with our our microbiome. So the only way to, to it, well, it's hard to avoid, but eating organically where possible is a way to avoid that. So we're going to a local farmer's market that doesn't have to be labeled organic, but you can ask, do you use glyphosate? And if not, then that's a good farm to support or growing your own food or We'll talk about that more in a little while. And certain medications can disrupt the microbiome, um, but they can also save lives. So it's, you know, we have to find ways to stimulate and feed the microbiome if we're on medications. And I can't stress enough this last one. Stress, stress, stress. Stress is, it, it is so difficult to stay healthy when we have no way of managing our stress. I strongly recommend finding ways to, to manage that meditation, yoga, walking, hanging out with friends, watching something funny, um, reading something funny, anything that will reduce your stress levels, finding ways to balance some of the... Um, some of the crazy schedules that we all have, it's really, really important. And, and it brings benefit to not just the microbiome, but in all aspects of our lives. Um, all right, let's get to some of the good stuff. So how do we strengthen the microbiome? Um, let's look at foods high fiber foods. You hear this all the time. Oh, you need to eat a diet rich in fiber. And, and I don't think we ever really say why, but when we have a lot of fiber in our food, that's food, that's the part that can't be digested from our food. And what it does is it actually acts like a, almost like a scrubber as it goes through your intestines. It, it cleans things out. It feeds your microbes. Your microbes help to, um, hang on to the toxins and get them out. And the more fiber, and I'm not talking about so much that you end up with an irritated um, intestinal tract, but uh, fiber where you're, it's moving your bowels, where you have a, a healthy bowel movement every day, that is really important. It moves things through and it, it has health implications that are really far reaching. So fiber is important. And we don't have to take necessarily a supplement um, for that. I would say you're better eating fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and legumes and mushrooms and herbs and healthy fats because you're getting all those other compounds that are in those foods, those higher order compounds that are, um, that are like medicine in our, in our food. So really important. And the more variety of fruits and vegetables that you eat, especially vegetables, um, the, the healthier you're going to be. We tend to get very narrow in our food choices. And they've done studies with kids where they find they eat the same 10 foods all week and it really doesn't vary. And so we always like to say, if you go to a farm, try some new things, things you've never tried before. Try to get expansive in the variety of things you eat because they all have different plant medicines in them that act as, um, as, as deep nutrition for us. So um, we're, let's go back to the list, healthy fats, um, animal products. Um, it, when you're eating those, you really, you know, want to get those that have been eating what they're meant to eat so that they are healthy because if the foods you're eating are healthy, you're going to be healthy and it reduces your chance of, of having a lot of toxins in the food. Organic where you can. There is an organization called 
Environmental Working Group, or EWG. And um, if you go to their site, they have something called the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. And it lists the foods that they, every year they do tests and they find which fruits and vegetables have the highest level of toxins. And those are the ones they say, if you're limited on what you can spend, buy those organically if you can, or go to a farm that has good practices. Um, and then the, the clean 15 are the ones that you really, you can eat without worrying about the organic label on them. Okay, you can grow your own food, even if it's just a couple of peas out in the garden, a couple of heads of lettuce, all of that is so great. Um, we know that there is a bacteria in the soil that mimics serotonin. Serotonin is one of those neurotransmitters that makes you feel good. And there are lots of benefits to being in a garden. We use garden therapy everywhere, in prisons, in schools, in nursing homes. In, it's used because it, it really helps your microbiome and your, um, I think your mental health. I think it's just a really important thing to do. Um, and then again, fermented foods. So I think I'm gonna say fermented foods till the end, but I do just want to say here, Every culture, every culture has fermented foods. Fermented foods have been used for thousands of years when we have foods that are um, perishable, fruits and vegetables and meats and fish, things like that. Before we had refrigeration, people had to have a way of preserving that to keep it from going bad before they could eat it, especially when they depended on that at the end of a season. Let's say you, you grew a field of cabbage and at the end of the season, when it was time to pick it, you can only eat so much cabbage. So what do you do with all that so it doesn't go bad? They began to ferment it and make sauerkraut. And they can take that and have that last for an entire year. And when you do that, it increases the nutritional content. It helps to pre-digest it. And it's teeming with microbes that are beneficial for us. And it's very safe and stable. People made crocs barrels of that and put it into their basement. And it got them through the winters. In high in vitamin C, so in the deep winter when there weren't a lot of things, you could eat these fermented foods and stay healthy. Um, really important. And some of our best, most delicious foods are fermented. So I think right now I'll just give you the list, even though we're going to talk about it again. Um, things like cheese, our cheeses are fermented. Um, we have sauerkraut. We have kimchi, which is um, spicy cabbage and other vegetables. Um, we have um, tempeh and I'm trying to save the good ones for last. So going through the rest, miso, um, chocolate, coffee, wine, beer, kombucha, the list goes on and on. Those foods are all fermented and increase their nutritional value, nutrient density, and shelf life. So really important. Okay. Oh, so here's just a reminder of eating things in season. This is a beautiful peach tree from this summer. Um, Colorful vegetables. These are carrots and potatoes. These are pur uh, purple potatoes and red outside potatoes and the creamy white inside. These are the, the different colored carrots, Brussels sprouts. All of those things are high in fiber. And this time of year, they're all coming into season and fresh at the farms and really much more nutrient dense for us. Um, and, and we tend to crave these things this time of year because of the 
temperatures going down and, and our bodies craving warmth. Here's another picture with some herbs in it, you know, and the garlic, such a powerhouse food and sage and thyme and Brussels sprouts and, and carrots and potatoes, okay? Legumes, beans and seeds and nuts and those beautiful foods. And then mushrooms. You don't have to go out and forage. I just loved th this photo of uh, these mushrooms growing up this tree. This is a local uh, picture. And this time of year, the mushrooms are prolific outdoors, but also local farmers now are growing a lot of mushrooms. And so you can go to farmers markets and other grocery stores and find local um, mushrooms that have been grown in the area. So. What else helps? We've talked about lifestyle. So playing in the dirt, we said gardening really helps to um, enhance your microbiome, but kids being able to play in the dirt and get dirty is so important for their immune system and training their, their microbiome and their immune system. Exercising, there isn't really anything exercise doesn't help. Um, uh, eating organic food where possible, avoiding chemical toxins where possible, and again, reducing stress and hanging out with, with family and friends, which hasn't been easy the, this last year, but really important. And I think even Zoom has a place during, during this last year. So diet and lifestyle contribute to a healthy microbiome. So here are some of the summaries. Um, it's acquired through our lifetimes um, and is influenced by our diets and lifestyle. Healthy microbes make um, our neurotransmitters that are responsible for mood and sleep. Healthy microbes make nutrients that are essential for our health. Healthy microbes keep our immune systems healthy. Eating a diet rich in vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, legumes, keeps, oh, didn't, didn't check that one, helps to feed the microbes we want to flourish in our guts, okay? All right. So let's go to um, Nicole, do we have... Yes. Thank you, Joan. Yeah, we do. Hey, you have some questions. If you're ready for them, we have some great questions in the Q&A. Okay, good, good. Okay, so I am going to... I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Sure. There. sure. Okay, so um, uh, we have some very specific but great questions that get into some of the topics that you start, that you introduced. So uh, we first have someone um, asking about medications and the effects, the potential effects of medications um, such as uh, bupropion, uh, the, um, the uh, mental health, uh, behavioral health um, agent that is a norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitor um, that can cause significant constipation. Um, does that have any relationship to the microbiome? You know, I don't know that specifically, um, but what I would say is that um, because the microbiome is just a part of our bodies, our systems, that it, it, I cannot see that there would be any, there's no downside to enhancing your microbiome, to eating fermented foods. I do say when you're introducing fermented foods into your diet, like fiber, you, you, if it causes constipation, we know then you really need to eat high fiber foods and a lot of them. And fermented foods can help with that. Um, but I would say to start very small when there are some people who have absolutely no reaction. I mean, I can put a uh, half a cup of sauerkraut on my uh, sourdough bread and, and I would just think I was in heaven, but other people need to start with more of a teaspoon to start as a condiment and just put a little bit on their plate and try to increase that as they go to start building that microbiome. And I would imagine 
that that would modulate out. I, I, you know, I'm not an expert in that medication, so I, I am not sure, but that would be my reaction. Okay, great. Um, another one is um, from someone who is on medication for type 2 diabetes, and the medicines work by causing um, the body to get rid of extra sugar through the urine. Um, this person has noticed that they have started getting yeast infections for the first time mm -hmm. um, and don't have the option to stop taking the medication. So um, what, can, what can he or she do to reduce the yeast taking over? Yeah, well, and, and that's really interesting because one of the... Um, somebody who wasn't on medication, we would just definitely say, start upping your fermented foods and fiber. And I would say that to you too, although, um, you know, the medications may be contributing so that you're going to have to work a little harder at that. The, the thing is, is not consuming sugar. And when I say sugar, I also mean a lot of refined flour. So white flour in the form of breads and cakes and crackers and all of that, which you probably already know, um, acts like sugar in the body. And so if we can replace that with, you know, all of these incredible colorful vegetables and which adds to the fiber, which helps keep things moving through, um, and then adding some beautiful fermented foods, which I really I will spend a minute talking about some of these. Um, I would say that would really help. Uh, if you are, um, I would also say that eating some of these fermented vegetables and things are going to help with the potassium, which is going to help keep that. Um, diuretic aspect in a little bit in check. Um, did that answer your question or did that help? Because probiotic foods, okay, so let me back up a second. The foods we eat um, that have bacteria in them, those are called the, the microbial foods, the, the, the probiotics, okay, we're going to call them probiotics. They're for life. They're helpful to life. That's the microbe rich foods. When we eat the fruits and vegetables, they are actually the food for those microbes. So we call those prebiotics. So we have bi the biotic rich and then the prebiotic. So eating those things, lots of fibrous foods, lots of fermented foods, fermented foods that are vegetables, that will help your body fight some of those infections. Um, it's just, a, it can be a vicious cycle though, because you probably are being put on antibiotics to fight the infection, which kills off the bacteria that are gonna help, um, help with it. So there, um, yeah, so it, it's, it's tough, but I would start finding those fermented foods and I'll tell you where and how and all of that in a few minutes. Yeah, I think you actually got, you, you know, our next question was the difference. I think you just answered it, you know, the role of probiotics and the difference in probiotics versus prebiotics. So if there's anything else that you wanted to add about that, but I think you just touched on that. Yeah, yeah, the, pre the prebiotics are just making sure that the bacteria we, the bacteria we want to colonize are well nourished, well fed. So it, it offers us all the nourishment of those vegetables, keeps our bowel moving, which means we keep all that the, the toxins from building and feeds our bacteria. So those, it's just a win-win to have the prebiotic, the food, and the, the microbes. Great. Um, and just going back, so to the previous question, because there's a follow-up um, about the sugar um, and eliminating sugar, I think it was an important distinction that you made that it's not just sugar, sweet sugar, right? But the refined carbohydrates in our turn into glucose in our bloodstream. So it's any of those kinds of carbohydrate refined foods. Um, but so there's a follow-up question, eliminating sugar altogether is really tough, right? Um, and this person has done it, but eventually wore down and is now eating some. Is there a small amount that is okay? Can you talk a little bit about balance, Joan, in terms of, you know, not all or nothing, but you know, what's okay? Right. Well, so let's, we, we need to talk about, you know, where there, do I eat sugar? 
course I do. I have a lovely piece of chocolate at the end of a, a meal or, or if I just feel like that, but it's, it's when you find yourself craving sugar, you have to take a step back and say, okay, what, what signals am I getting and why am I, am I turning to that? So you don't have to avoid all sugar. You don't have to avoid all refined carbs, but it is difficult to eat from our grocery stores these days and not have sugar laden refined carb laden foods. So I would say you do, you never have to be a purist, but you need to find what works for you. And so maybe for a little while, like you said, you went sugar free for a while and now you're kind of breaking down. Well, that's okay to try to, you're working on an issue. You're trying to get through some health issues. So you're going to be really good for a while. And that's great. Maybe introducing fermented foods and upping your, your, your vegetables will help with that a bit. And then you have room for a little bit, but you, because it's been an issue before, or you have signs of it being an issue, you need to pay attention, right? So it's not like if somebody makes you some beautiful thing and brings you a beautiful piece of pie that they've made you, have a small piece of it and know that that's just was made with love for you. And you're going to do, you know, try to not consume a lot of sugar after that for a little while. It's, it's when it becomes every day, when it becomes every meal, when it's the thing you first think of, because you can't think of other things to make or, or grab. And so I think that you never have to be a purist, but you need to listen to your body and pay attention to when it becomes a problem. So great. Thank you. Um, Okay, next one. Is there a great question? Is there a way to measure the health of one's microbiome? In other words, other than having symptoms, how does one know the condition of our microbiome? Yeah, that is a good question. It's so fascinating because there are um, actual, um, there's, there are research groups, they're out there measuring the microbiome. Um, and they're, they're, telling you, you know, where your microbiome may have originated. Actually, there are labs. When you go to, to the doctor, sometimes they'll do, um, they'll culture stool samples to see what bacteria are in your, um, your gut if they think, if they suspect there's a problem. But in, there are also, I think it's called the microbiome study it I, I I'm I'm you can't quote me on that because I don't know the name but it is um where they're actually trying to map and um start checking the the microbes and see if they can tell where people um may have originated from because we know that certain regions of the world have certain types of bacteria and other regions have other types and they just did a study on um, bakeries that do sourdough breads and that have their starter, which is a microbial starter. It's a fermentation. And they had bakers send their ferments in and they analyze them from where to try and see where those microbes originated. And they were able to categorize people in certain groups. It was a fascinating um, piece of research. So I, I don't, I, you could try to find that um, group and then maybe see about getting your microbial, um, oh, biome studies, I believe biome studies, the microbiome can only see part of it. Um, so somebody just put that in the chat. Oh, I see. Yep. Biome, B-I-O-M-E, someone mentions. So yeah. and then like, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, it sounds like definitely more to come research in this area and hopefully the availability for lay people like us to have some kind of assessment. It's remarkable. So there was also a journalist who um, ended up, he had something that happened to him. And so he 
was going to try and re-inoculate. That's what we call it when you're trying to build up your microbiome, re-inoculate his microbiome. And he was get he was testing it every day. Now I don't, it was stool samples. I don't know. He was working with um, some scientists and stuff to see how long it took to build it back up. And um, it, it, it isn't a fast thing. Um, uh, the somebody else is talking about the plant paradox. Which yeah, is that was another one of the questions in the Q and A too. We have a couple about foods specifically. So oh, good I because I would love to just quickly talk yeah. about them before we run out of time. Yeah, um, we're we're okay now. We're a few minutes before before five, and we had allowed for five fifteen. So hopefully, okay, folks good. can stay on because we do want to see all of the beautiful things that you have there, Joan. Um, let me just throw a couple of these food questions at you. So, um, um, should people with autoimmune disease avoid vegetables from the nightshade family? Um, I think that's really dependent on each individual. Um, you know, there, I, I know people who have no issue at all with the nightshades and I know others who eat even a small amount of, of pepper and will wake up with stiff joints and things like that. So I think it's, that's a really, um, individual question and not a blanket question. Uh, okay. Gotcha. What would you recommend for someone who does not like many vegetables or fruits? So a picky eater, what would your recommendations be? Is this an adult or a child? Uh, let's say yes. Let, okay. Let's say it's an adult. I'm not sure on the question, but we're going to. Okay. Uh, well, you know, first of all, there are people who have, um, more taste buds in their mouth and they tend to be sensitive to textures and things like that. So they, they eating a lot of fruits and vegetables can be difficult. I would say though, it's also what you were brought up on and what you've kind of trained yourself to like. So what I would, would say is to begin introducing a couple of new things a week and find a way that you like to cook it. You know, pureeing things into your soups. You know, if you take carrots and kale and, and you know, beautiful legumes and things like that, and then puree it into a really lovely textured soup you you may it may not be as difficult to do that um i would say you just you really it's kind of a, a mind over if it isn't a, a physiological thing it's something that you just kind of have to develop and that's a slow process you know that what do they say nine times sometimes you have to have food nine times before you start stop having an aversion to it um and pureeing seems to be a great way to do it. And we're heading into soup season. We're heading into the time where we want warm and wet foods and hearty. So that might be a good time to try it. Roasting brings mm -hmm. out the sweetness in vegetables. And so if you do a big, beautiful tray of um, vegetables with some herbs and spices and salt and pepper and olive oil and you roast it just so it gets nice and um, kind of caramely bringing out its natural sugars, that sometimes will help. And then you could even puree that into a soup. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just a training of our palate. It's like Great developing ideas. a taste for wine, you know, you, you develop that with experience. Great ideas. Um, smoothies too are another, I think, uh, you know, way of getting things in, you know, that kind of liquid form, um, right, right. Um, that people like. So um, did you have, so there are a couple of questions about the plant paradox. Um, did you have any thoughts on uh, Dr. Gundry's plant paradox protocol? I have not read the protocol. So okay. if the, the premise is that um, I believe he focuses on um, some of these very same foods that we're talking about are beneficial for cultivating the microbiome and um, and potentially sometimes limiting nightshades and things that might uh, cause information inflammation um, or discomfort in certain individuals. So um, well, because what we know about plants is that when they are healthy, when they grow in healthy soil and they are able to produce 
um, what we would call a nutrient dense plant. Mm -hmm. It's or it has the ability to produce these higher order compounds, which actually are um, they can be they they actually protect the plant from predators and disease. And they can actually be some of the bioflavonoids and those higher order compounds that we eat, like antioxidants, we blueberries for the antioxidants. But those, you know, the, the difference between a, a poison and a cure is the dosage. So if, if somebody has a sensitivity to some of those things, they can cause irritation. But then at the same time, some of those same compounds can end up being beneficial for us. So it's really learning to listen to your body. And I don't think we have a, a real blanket statement because it is so complicated. Nature is so complicated and fascinating. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, I'm going to lump a couple of questions here together about probiotics. So are there any foods that actually contain the probiotics? And then as a follow-up to that, can you talk a little bit about over-the-counter probiotics, supplements, and, and their effectiveness or their, your point of view on, on uh, taking probiotic supplements? Okay. Well, um, so probiotic means for life. So anything that is a fermented food is going to have, is what we would call a probiotic. It's got the bacteria in it. Um, so through the process of fermentation, we actually drop the acid level of, of the food so that only the bacteria that we really want, this is called lacto-fermentation, the lactobacillus, those things are able to thrive and virulent bacteria are killed off. So these become loaded with bacteria that we do want. Um, and so this would be considered a probiotic food, not a prebiotic to feed this, it's, it's, it's in here. And so when we ingest it, we are, we are helping to colonize our bacteria. It's the same when we drink kombucha, you know, we're getting another kind of, of bacteria in there. I'm not promoting these brands, it's just one I had in my house because my Kombucha is very easy to make, but mine is in need of a new batch. And this is, I wonder if I can, that is the thing, the actual SCOBY, we call it, that makes, um, that colonizes and takes sugar and tea and makes it into this, um, it consumes the sugar and the caffeine so that there's really no, sh very little sugar or caffeine left and it becomes this probiotic rich food or drink. And actually sometimes if you have like that gurgly stomach and you, from eating and you t sip a little bit of this kombucha, it can really settle that. Um, you must have seen our next question because that's what it was, Joan. You're right. Oh, you're, you're way ahead oh, of us. The sugar question about um, whether or not there's any residual sugar left in kombucha and beer. But you just answered that it eats the scoby in the process of fermenting, eats most of that sugar. So the end product has very little, right? Right. But it does have some. It does have some. You can taste because when it doesn't, it becomes vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> and you end up eat, having something very, very tart and almost not palatable. Okay, so I think we've got, let me see, there are a few others, but I want to make sure to give you time to show us some of what you have, uh, okay. uh, you know, on your counter there, some of the beautiful things um, that we haven't seen yet, um, and to talk about any of the other food um, recipe type things uh, before we end at 515. So, okay, well, one of the things that I really like, first of all, I'm going to tell you, we have some local companies. I make my own sauerkraut. This is actually red cabbage, carrot, cilantro, um, coriander seed, and cumin seed in there. And I make that, and that's my um, sauerkraut, and I make that for eating with Southwestern dishes. It's really good on... Um, on tacos and fish tacos and regular tacos. Um, but you, we have um, a few companies. This one is a local company. This is pretty expensive. 
if you go look at this is another one out of New York. Um, they're both cut, considered local. Um, this is a kimchi, which is very spicy, and this is a sauerkraut. So this one's Hawthorne Valley, and this one is real pickles. They are expensive. If you look at the price for a jar, like this is probably eight dollars. You're using very little, and so these last a long time. And then once you learn to make it, it's so inexpensive to make um, your own sauerkraut. Fast, easy, uh, fun. Um, one year for Christmas, we gave all our friends and family crocs, small crocs. And then for New Year's, we had a fermentation party and we all taught, we taught them all how to make sauerkraut. It was really fun. And <laughs> um, so ferment those ferments, if you don't want to make your own, you go get some and just have a little bit. I have to share a story. I have a friend. He is um, a scientist and he is a skeptic and came to my house one day when we were about to eat lunch. Um, we had beautiful sourdough bread, true 24 hour fermentation and <laughs> yay fermentation parties. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so, and with some really local, beautiful cheddar cheese, which is fermented, we had toasted that till it melted and then topped it with sauerkraut. And when he walked in, he thought, oh no, I'm gonna have to eat lunch with them. And so we made him some, he ate it, asked for seconds and told me later that he was not clear what was different, but he felt different. And he, he said, there's no, no way to put my finger out. This is not his personality to get excited about something like that. And he has been fermenting ever since. That was maybe eight years ago and he has fermented constantly since then. So it can make, I've seen with, with clients, I've seen um, some emotional things that seem to be helped by adding fermented food. So it, I've seen a lot of it. Um, I, you cannot, though, I don't think stay really healthy if you just don't want to cook. I think it's just so hard these days. It's something we have to figure out how to fit back in and use it as a, a sense of, of, well, first of all, privilege to be able to spend time cooking our food and really realize that we are fortunate and it tastes so good when you get better at it. And it's a great thing to do with your friends that to fix meals together and, um, you know, just sharing that it, it feeds you on that anti-stress level and it feeds your microbiome on the happy level. It, it just is far reaching, but I just want to show you a few things. So this is something I grew this year. Can, can you see what it is? Do you have a guess, Nicole? Can you guess what that is? Oh, um, let me see if anybody else wants to guess before I shout out. Um, it's hard to tell in this, in a Zoom. I would have to guess maybe currants would be my first guess. Oh, that's a really good guess. These are actually cranberry beans. Cranberry beans. Okay, so we got some raspberries. Yeah. yeah, they're stunning. They're just absolutely beautiful. They, they're they delicious in a soup. They're really easy to grow. They're pole, they grow as pole beans. And the legumes are one of our big hitters for fiber. They really are, they're inexpensive. They add body and, and meat to a dish. So making a soup and finding ways to add beans. These are cranberry beans. These are my black beans I grew this year. Um, and they too are so much sweeter and delicious in Mexican, you know, Southwestern dishes and um, just really, really add a lot. Here we have um, the red lentils that add beauty to a lentil soup. Here are the, the these are actually the little French lentils um, in here. Let me just hold some up. They're, yeah, I'm not going to be able to I show you. Can you see those? Yes. Yeah. So the lentils. 
So lentil soup. And, and bazillions of recipes online. All you have to do is type in lentils and soup and you get uh, 10,000 recipes. Um, so anything that adds these beans here are chickpeas. If you like um, hummus, um, adding these into a Mediterranean type dish, you know, um, soup is fabulous. All these vegetables you can add you know, you've got your squashes this time of year, making a squash soup and adding some bean to it. So now you've got the fibers um, from different sources, all of the tomatoes that are out there right now from the farm stands. Um, shallots, onions, garlic that is just prolific right now and so beneficial um, for our, my, our microbial health and our, um, uh, our health overall. So it's interesting with garlic is that garlic has been found to be as effective a, a, a antibiotic as te tetracycline and penicillin. It actually in clinical studies has shown to lower blood pressure, cholesterol, um, high blood pressure. It's, it's really powerful. But the, the medicine that actually does that doesn't exist in here right now. This, it, that medicine that has that medicinal property doesn't exist until we break this garlic clove open. When you take a clove of garlic and you, you smash it or chop it or do whatever you're going to do, the exposure to oxygen actually causes a, a chemical reaction, an oxidative chemical reaction that does 10 to 12 different enzymatic changes. And it, so it starts as alanine and develops into allicin, which is the medicinal part of that. And the thing is, is we find it doesn't really, um, it, it, you know, it's, it, we, so we call it antimicrobial, right? Because it's anti, it's, it's effective as effective an antibiotic, but it doesn't seem to affect negatively our microbiome. So quite remarkable because we've evolved with that and the microbes in our body and the foods, they, we, we, it, it knows how to work together. It's just, it, we've evolved together. So it, quite remarkable, quite fascinating and exciting. Also interesting. And it all looks so good behind you that I'm sure that we all wish we were coming to your house for dinner tonight, Jeff. Well, we have to, no, I don't know if you do. There are nights where you, I'm not sure. Mushrooms are the other one I wanted to mention. This was a, uh, this is a maitake or hen of the woods that, um, wow we have foraged for mushrooms are prolific this year. I don't recommend doing that unless you're experienced and, or go with people who are experienced, but mushrooms actually, um, I had something here I wanted to say that they actually um, change cell pro proliferation, have anti-inflammatory and anti-tumorogenic -tumor um, effects on mushrooms, that's in research. These mushrooms are being studied um, extensively on, for the microbiome, the immune system, um, for, for cancer research. And it is just incredibly um, prolific right now. And so you can get those um, local mushrooms, you can and in the stores now, even the shiitake, shiitake are incredibly um, great for the immune system. So adding some of those to your soup is a great idea. When and it will, it will certainly, rubber. yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, um, you know, over time the research is presented on these compounds. Um, certainly not to be a replacement for any of our current medications or therapies, right? But as an addition to, um, you know, in, in conjunction with those things that we can do things for ourselves in our own kitchen. Right, and they're not meant to take the place. None of these foods are foods are really important in our lives and in how to live a healthy life or how to regain some health, but they are never meant, they have met what we like to say medicine in the food. That's where a lot of our medicines have come from or from our foods. It doesn't mean replace. It means 
in conjunction. It means preventative maybe, that if eating really well can help prevent certain issues. It, it, I would never suggest that someone say, yeah, I'm throwing that medicine out and I'm gonna start <laughs> eating garlic every day. I would say eat garlic along with it and make your soups and yeah. For yeah, sure. Good point. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, um, Joan. This has been amazing. Um, and there's so much great feedback in the chat. We are at time. So I want to make sure to respect your time, Joan, and everyone else who's been with us today. Thank you so much for this enlightening presentation and all your um, information that you shared with us. Um, I know we all look forward to going home and putting it into practice in our kitchens. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for taking the time today to, to join me. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us and for your wonderful questions and comments. Um, please do um, complete the evaluation for the program that you'll get automatically after and um, send us any feedback or uh, information for future topics. And we look forward to seeing you um, all on a future Smilo Wellness Workshop. Have a great evening, everyone. And thank you all for being a part.